Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today's episode is brought to you by the Health Coach Success Virtual Masterclass. My co-host Laura and I worked hard to pull together this special online event just for you. It's a five-day mini course in which we interview the best and brightest health coach and marketing experts on the planet to try to understand how they've become such great coaches and entrepreneurs. Included in the 20 plus expert interviews are some names you might recognize. Primal Health Coach Institute founder Mark Sisson, celebrity nutrition expert and New York Times bestselling author JJ Virgin, author, cardiologist, and staunch health coach advocate, Dr. William Davis, Michelle Liotta of Health Coach Power Community, Michelle Norris, CEO of Paleo FX and ID Life Nutrition, and many, many more. The Health Coach Success Virtual Masterclass is now available and totally free for a limited time. Check it out at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash success. Today on the show, we're welcoming Anna Freeling. Anna Freeling is a health coach in private practice in the town of Grand Island, Nebraska, and she's established such a strong reputation there that physicians are sending their metabolic syndrome patients over to her for her unique, hands-on approach to health coaching. Anna's journey to health coaching began with a rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis, and she began curiously devouring books and research on the causes and treatments. Following a vague hunch, she had herself tested for celiac disease, which came back positive. This opened Anna's mind to the fact that chronic and autoimmune disease stems from the gut and that our diet can have incredible impacts on our health, both good and bad. She believes that food is information and she feels proud and privileged to help decode this information for her many thankful clients whose health she's helped turn around. Let's hear more from Anna herself. All right, Anna, thank you so much for joining us on Health Coach Radio. We're super excited to have you here. How are you? Good, and thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for giving us some of this time. So we like to start every podcast with a little bit of your origin story. We want our listeners to understand who Anna is, you know, what was it that sparked your interest in health coaching and how you got here? Well, Mark Sisson is the answer (laughs) and uh, what sparked me to want to be a health coach, but I was in a, a very big crisis. I had gotten diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and it was severe. And for three years, I almost couldn't wipe my own ass. And that's no joke. And I literally uh, was on so much medication. I was on um, Enbrel, which they then switched to Humira. I was on 30 milligrams of prednisone, methyltrexate, and Plaquenil. And methyltrexate is a chemo drug. And my hair was falling out. And I still wasn't getting relief. And this was for three years. And I uh, found out I had celiac Mm -hmm. uh, because I read this book, Celiac, the Hidden Epidemic. And I was like, uh, I started thinking I better get tested. I got tested. I tested positive. And I started thinking back, you know, I had had um, psoriasis of the nails when I was a young child. I I weighed like 104 pounds at you know, 18 years old at like five, five and a half, you know? And so I I just started looking back and seeing all the connecting the dots. And I started wondering what other foods could be affecting my health because just removing the gluten, I stopped being so stiff in the mornings. My fatigue lifted. I started feeling some hope again, just from removing this one toxin from my body. And that's when I found Mark's daily apple and whatever he said to do, I did after that. And I tried AIP and I did all of these things. And then when he came out with the coaching program, I think I may have talked to you, Laura. Yeah, you you would have, yep. To uh, become enrolled. And it took me a little while to get through the course because I was homeschooling my daughter and I was just, you know, not making the commitment. I'm not going to make any excuses. I could have um, committed to finishing it sooner, but I do believe I was an early sign on for the coaching program. Mm -hmm. It took me, it took me 18 months to finish. So no shame in that game. <laughs> so you changed your, <laughs> you, changed your, you changed your diet and you managed to, your rheumatoid arthritis went into remission. Was it pretty dramatic and pretty 
Well, I was able to get off of first my prednisone, and then I was able to get off of Plaquenil, and it took me several more years to get off of um, the, the uh, methyltrexate, which enhances the uh, Humira working. And so what happened was Mark came out with Keto Reset. Mm. And I noticed within a week and a half that I wasn't stiff at all in the mornings. And I was already low carbohydrate. I was already probably around 70 to 80 grams of carbs a day. So going down to 50 total grams or less a day, I couldn't believe the difference. Hmm. I don't know if that was, I was eating less um, fruits and less, you know, things that were maybe, maybe it was a blood sugar thing, or maybe it was a plant antigen type deal. I'm not sure what it was, but my fatigue lifted and I was finally able to get off of methyltrexate and I had tried for years to get off of it. And then I actually, last December, I became ill with an upper respiratory infection. I've got a daughter who brings germs into the house from high school, you know, and so yeah. I got sick and I was able, to, I, I actually had to stay off of my Humira and it ended up, I was, I stayed off of it for 10 full months with no, with no um, symptoms, but I became, I started getting symptoms again about six, no, about 12 weeks ago, I guess. And they were getting pretty bad pretty fast. I had gotten glutened going out to eat. Oh. Um, they accidentally served me deep fried um, Brussels sprouts. And I thought they were just pan fried because they knew I was celiac. And one of my, the, one of the women I was having dinner with looked over at my Brussels sprouts and said, why are yours brown and mine aren't? And I realized right then after I'd eaten two thirds of them that, you know, and I react really bad autoimmune wise mm -hmm. to gluten. So it put me right back into a pretty bad episode. So I did choose to go back on Humira. I was never trying to get off of it. I don't, uh, I don't believe in, um, you know, having my joints go to hell in a handbasket mm -hmm. because I think I should be able to control this autoimmunity that I have. And so for me, uh, if, I can, if I can mitigate the immune response I have through diet, I'm going to do it. And through lifestyle, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And that may mean that I have to have some uh, biologics in my life. It may mean not forever. It may mean I don't have to do it every two weeks. Maybe I can taper off and I'll be talking to my doctor about that. So I keep a very open mind about that. Well, thank you for mm -hmm. saying that. I, I, I like hearing that actually. I don't want health coaches to think that we're going to replace, like that we need to replace mm -hmm. medications for diagnosed disease states. That's not, that's not what we need to do. And in a lot of cases, the meds need to remain and we can just help support the body in yeah. the background. So I love that you said that. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Absolutely. Wait, well, it's funny because my, I've mentioned this before, like Brad, my husband has suffered from clinical anxiety and depression since he was a child and he's been on medication for it. And when he eats well, he kind of feels like he's cured. Right. And then he'll forget to replace his medicine. And then, and he does okay for a couple of weeks and then it comes back. Right. So he's just the, I, the lifestyle and the diet makes the medication that he's on more effective. He has fewer episodes in between because like even the medication is not necessarily like a cure for him. He still exactly. has episodes, right? But when he eats well and he exercises, it's a big thing for him. It just makes the medication that he's on so much more effective and he has fewer episodes. So it's not our job to get people off medicines. It's a, a doctor's job, you know, so thank you from me as well. <laughs> All right. So Anna, you tell us about, I mean, we were kind of talking off air about this idea around, around niching and that's something that you have some opinions about. So is your niche rheumatoid arthritis women or no? <laughs> I don't have a niche. My niche is live well now. My niche is don't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. And if you don't do something today, nothing's going to happen. You know, um, yeah. I read somewhere recently that 20% planning can lead to 80% results. And I believe that. I believe if I, if I just change a little bit of something today, then my tomorrow could be a lot more promising. In other words, I'm not going to be doing something to hurt myself anymore. Maybe I've just removed something that could harm me. 
And maybe that's the 20% that I did today. But I just truly believe that people want to live a vibrant and healthy life. And that means more than just the way you eat. Mm -hmm. It means more than following some kind of dogma. It means enjoying every bite of food that you put into your mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Making choices that bring you joy in your life. Mm -hmm. It means <laughs> eliminating other things like bad relationships. <clears throat> Not just... <clears throat> not just your relationship with food, but your relationship with other people. Are you standing up for, for yourself? Are you, do you have healthy boundaries? Mm -hmm. Are you eating foods against your will because somebody else is feeding them to you and you're afraid to say no? It's all this whole mindset, I think, of um, taking care of yourself and being responsible for yourself in a way that isn't angry or mean or in anybody's face, but learning how to like navigate in a healthy way through life. I think that's yeah. such a tremendous message, you know, the live well now niche, right? And because you're absolutely right. Like I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Well, you wake up the next day, there's another tomorrow. So it, it never really arrives. You kind of have to do it now. And I love your message about being responsible for yourself because I don't know about you, but almost every client I take on having hired me was their first step in that process because up until then they were taking responsibility for themselves. Somebody else was driving the bus, right? Um, somebody else was making decisions for them or they were just, here's the other thing. Like they're just going with the flow. They weren't doing things on purpose. Right. You know? So I, I, I just love that whole message. I would like to hear a little bit about where, how you went from, you know, trying to get yourself out of, um, you know, what you've been dealing with, with RA, where was the aha, you know what, I really think I can help other people. I want to be a coach. What was that process like? Well, I think um, part of my story is I'm a recovering addict with 30 years clean and I've always valued sponsorship in the 12 step program that I'm a part of. And so uh, I have utilized the 12 steps and a sponsor for myself, as well as helped a lot of women through the 12 steps. And I've watched magic happen. I've watched people become responsible, productive members of society from you know, living homeless or living on the streets. And so I really am a very hopeful person and I really believe that people can change and they do change. And sometimes that all they need is someone to believe in them and I'm definitely um, wired to do that. I'm definitely wired to cheerlead someone on and to say, you know, and to, and to help them sort out what isn't your fault. Like, for instance, I don't believe it's someone's fault that they became obese or diabetic when they're trying to follow our food pyramid or my plate. I believe that mm -hmm. it's all the faulty science. <laughs> I believe that if, they're, if they can't keep the weight off from Weight Watchers, it's because they're hungry and they haven't learned how to mitigate those hormones through um, eating the right kinds of calories. You know, I have clients come to me all the time and the first thing they say to me is I want to lose weight. And I tell them, well, that's great, but I'm not a weight loss coach. I'm a health coach. Mm -hmm. I don't have a scale in my office. And I, quite frankly, I don't give a damn how much you weigh. And they all they look kind of puzzled, but they look relieved every single time. They look relieved because they realize I'm telling them the truth of what I really believe. And then I proceed to tell them a healthy body will weigh what it's supposed to weigh. And I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe when we choose nine calories of healthy fat over nine calories of unnatural fats, those healthy fats are going to tell our body something different than those unnatural fats are going to tell us. I also tell them that I'm not going to yeah. tell them anything that isn't common sense. And when I tell them these common sense things, they're going to just be like, wow, this is so true. <laughs> what did your grandma eat? Did she have bacon and eggs for breakfast? Or did she have a bowl of raisin bran that contains 44 grams of carbohydrates? And they don't know what a gram of carbohydrates is. So, right. you know, I take them on grocery store tours and I show them, I call it the Isle of Death because mm -hmm. the serial killers live there. I say, look at this box of Raisin Bran. There are 70 different names for sugar. How can it be your fault if you can't figure out what to eat? And yeah. so I say, this is 11 grand, 
11 teaspoons of sugar. Just divide it by four. Just divide the carbohydrates by four. And they look at me like, I could have had a V8. <laughs> like, why okay. did I do this? Why wasn't I taught this? Yeah, it's empowering. Mm-hmm. Who gets the power back for the first time in their lives? Yeah, I don't know about you, but I remember when, you know, when I had gotten sick and had, and had suffered through the conventional medical paradigm, and then finally... It was somebody who saw me just looking like hell, right? And was like, wow, you don't look good. That I finally just broke down and told him everything that was going on, referred me to a naturopathic person. And literally it was fixing my, I just, it was an elimination diet, right? Similar to I'm sure what you went through and some lifestyle changes. And, and I remember being just kind of mad that I didn't, why didn't I know this? Because this makes so much sense, right? Um, and why aren't we taught this early on? We're actually taught the polar opposite. So I, I 100% agree with you. And I think our clients deserve that space to just feel, you know, bewildered and forgive themselves for that. It's not their fault. And, but now they know. And what are you going to do with it? That's right. Yeah. And I think too that, you know, now you know thing. That's where coaching comes in. Yeah. Because- know and the information is out there and it's abundant and it's free and when I do a free session I don't mess around I tell them I'm going to give you enough information to point your feet in the right direction because I want you to be healthy whether you decide to hire me as your health coach or not because I really do I really do want people to take back their health and own their health I would love for Grand Island, Nebraska, where I live, to be the healthiest city in the state of Nebraska. Mm. If I could manage to get my clients on board with that and help me spread the news, I tell them if they coach with me, this will become a lifestyle that's fun and easy and they can teach others and they can help other people in their own families, you know, to get better and to heal as much as humanly possible. Like you said, Some people are still going to need a medication for whatever it is, but we can live within our own wellness. You know, it's a, it's a continuum. How well do I get to be today? A lot of that is decided on what impact my lifestyle has on me, the everyday choices that I make from what do I eat? Do I not eat? Mm -hmm. What do I eat? How much do I eat? When do I eat? Do I enjoy my life or am I stressed out? Do I stop and take a minute to learn to breathe? And I like, uh, I I wanted to tell you guys about this thing if you're not familiar with it, but I tell all of my people to do box breathing because for one thing, it's not very woo woo and they don't have to feel like they have to go to another plane or, you know, own an amethyst or (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just an everyday person thing to, that you can do box breathing. But I discovered this little relaxator, which I absolutely love. And it's a breathing tool that slows your breathing down when you breathe out. And so you can take like maybe six to four um, respirations per minute. And it really lowers your cortisol. Hmm. And it's an easy little tool. So I like to give my clients like super easy, practical. I think I'm a very practical person. Like I'm going to show you how to fish. And then you're going to be able to fish. It sounds like it. And I love that you tell your clients, like, I'm not going to tell you anything that's not common sense. Mm-hmm. I-, I love that soundbite. Um, so I just want to be clear. You offer up a free session to anybody first. Yes. And in that free session, you're giving, you're dispensing information already? Yes. Lots of information. I believe what Mark Sisson says, that give them, give them everything and they'll still want more. And I found that to be true for myself. I've had people say, let me think about it. And then three months later, come back to me and say, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I understand the value of coaching because information is one thing. Transformation is a whole other deal. So transformation occurs when you make decisions about what you're going to do with that information. And so I think that what a coach really does and where we are really efficient because anyone can buy a great book and they can read it, but can they manifest that book in their lives? So mm-hmm. I identify a person's strengths and I like to start with their strengths. And then I start working on their self-talk and I don't do it by pointing out, do you hear yourself saying this or that? But they'll say, well, week one, and I still drank two sodas, you know, and yeah. also 
that's great. You only drank two sodas. You were drinking like three a day. Are you kidding me? I'm thrilled. You know, and they start, you see their face light up and you see them start to understand they've made progress. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a, and I also like to make things like really manageable for them. Like what's one little thing you can do? One of the things that I ask people to do is just get rid of the breakfast cereal and change their breakfast. That's it. And usually they come back and they've and they're like, wow, I wasn't hungry until lunchtime and I decided to change my lunch too. So they're already starting to be responsible for themselves because I'm not making a demand. You have to change everything, you know, all at once. I don't believe that that's sustainable. I don't believe that it's fair. I don't mm-hmm. believe that it's easy on your body. And there's no reason that, that we should have to rip the Band-Aid if there's no acute emergency. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about how you find your clients? How do you find these clients that want to live well now? Well, some how of do they find you? Maybe that's a better uh, question. I have a web page, and some of them have found me through that. And then, you know, uh, the universe has things happen. And, you know, and one of the things that happened to me is my husband is a cardiologist. And his, one of his partners was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, adult mm-hmm. onset. And this gentleman is, has actually been um, interviewed by Jonathan Guyman and for the Joe Health Show. So that mm-hmm. should be coming up soon. And I actually hooked them up because I think Doug's story is amazing. He actually just ran the New York City Marathon. And mm-hmm. the type 1 diabetic that's doing very low keto. So he's like six grams of carbs in the morning, six at lunch and 12 at night. Well, he was on his little journey and his wife reached out to me. And so Kim and I talked and talked and talked on the phone about, you know, you've got to get him hooked up with Dr. Bernstein, who is world, I mean, to me, I, he, I can't believe he's not better known than he is because he is the king of type 1 diabetes, if you ask me. He was talking about keto and low carb, and he was an engineer who became a doctor, and he's still practicing in his 80s in New York. And so Doug wasn't listening to Kim about this, but then he simultaneously, like a couple of weeks later, ran into some literature about Dr. Bernstein, and then all of a sudden he was interested in what I had to say. Mm -hmm. um, I think he just... He's a really soft-spoken guy, but what he ended up doing was he wanted to bring me around to different doctor's offices and have me talk about low-carbon keto for healing. And so he took me to three different doctor's offices around the area. And then I've also taken opportunities to um, do any health fair, any little grocery store thing that I can do. Um, I speak for free at cardiac rehab. I go in and I, I, I'll sit there for an hour with one group of people and then I'll come back later in the day and I'll sit there for an hour with another group of people and I give away a ton of information. And uh, sometimes these people have referred me clients, you know, even if they don't use me themselves. And then now I'm at the point where I have clients referring clients to me. Mm-hmm. And I was never on Facebook on Facebook, you know, several months ago, and I started a piece of keto private Facebook group, and I don't have any rules, not one. And uh, I've only had one person be kind of smarmy, but she had a good point. She said she doesn't like listening to videos when people are saying hi to everyone. Oh, hi, Laura. Hi, Erin. You know, and that was me because I'm friendly. And Mm -hmm. I felt like kind of soft in the stomach, but I was like, you know what, she's right. And so I wrote, I wrote her back, you know, openly, and I said, thank you for the constructive criticism. I totally see your point. I hope you decide to stay here, and I will, I I appreciate when people are honest with me and help me grow. And she wrote back, thank you so much for taking it as the constructive criticism it was meant to be. I decided to be a grown-up and hear what she was really saying, and, uh, and my group has grown to over 250 people, and I do a, um, Facebook Live almost every Saturday morning over whatever they want me to talk about, macros, carnivore, I've done tons, and I give tons of information. And right now I have two people from my piece of keto that have been with me for a long time that are coming in for their free consultation. And so 
they've done the paperwork and they're they're getting scheduled to come in uh, and work with me. The, even though I give them all this information for free, they they want more. <laughs> okay, so that's awesome. I um I want to understand. So when you offer up this free session, there's there's a full intake that they go through. Yes. So the same and then that you guys gave us on okay. Coach Institute. I didn't change a thing. Oh, good. Okay. Interesting. That's interesting. So, that's so interesting to me because it's, I never thought to do that. Like to offer, because for like, here's, here's where my, my mind is going. Cause I do a discovery session where, you know, this is pretty typical, pretty typical procedure, but you're going to answer a few questions about yourself. We'll get on the phone and see if you're a good fit. Then if you're a good fit, I'm going to, uh, we're going to enroll you. You fill in the intake form, you pay me, we go. But what an interesting concept to do the full, full intake and bring the client in for a free session, give them tons of information that answers the concerns on their intake form. And if that works for them, then you've, then you've changed a life. And if, if it doesn't quite work for them, then you've probably got somebody who's going to at some point come back and sign mm -hmm. on with you. Exactly. So how does that work? So let's say I, I go take my free information and I go and I'm like, I get it, but I'm not, I'm having, a tr I'm struggling to implement it. Do I come back to you and you sign me up as a client? How does that go? Well, I don't do any contracts, none of that. I will take payments. And so, uh, uh, and I just keep track of them in a little notebook. <laughs> I have my clients made. Low tech. I put how much they pay and how much they owe, just kind of like an old fashioned invoice. And I don't give them any receipts or anything. I don't do any of that. I might have to start because I keep getting busier and busier. Right now I have 12 clients and that's a lot when you're talking about doing a grocery store tour, which mm -hmm. usually takes me about three hours. And then like tomorrow I have a cooking school at my house and I supply spices and the healthy fats and and we cook up a storm. I mean, they go home with tons of food for their freezer. And so it does, it gets, to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to look into managing my business better as I grow, but I'm very casual about it. And I answer a lot of questions because I really do care. And I think that the care is what shines through the individual when they meet with me, even if they don't want to use me, I still have an excellent reputation afterwards. And most people that haven't used me have said, wow, thank you so much for all of this information. I appreciate it so much. And they leave me with a very positive feeling and, and a feeling that I really do care. And I've even had people that didn't sign up with me send me other people. Right. So, used me. so I think it's kind of karma in a way. Yeah. Well, we keep hearing that from people. So, so you don't have any contracts, like your program's not any certain length of time. Is it, is it freestyle depending on who's sitting in front of you? How do you decide how it goes? Well, I decide I'm very, I'm a very intuitive person. So I do uh, fly by the seat of my pants a lot. I trust that I have an excellent education. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Coach Institute. I'm equipped. And, and where I'm not equipped, I'm willing to learn and grow. And I think that uh, my clients know that and have a lot of trust built into you. I don't have all the answers, but to the best of my ability, I'm going to go to bat for you and figure it out. And this is gonna be an enjoyable journey. So these things are common for each one of my clients. But, you know, I have clients that, uh, some of them are gung-ho, ready to go, let's rip the band-aid. So of course we're gonna speed that up for them. What I, what I um, charge for is results, not time. Some clients I might have to spend less time with and some clients I may have to spend more time with. And I think of it as almost a concierge type service where if they need to call me for the price I'm charging, go ahead and give me a call, text me, you know, ask me a question. And I also, uh, this morning I, I called one of my newer clients. She's already off of her insulin in two weeks of working with me. She also has, you know, other autoimmune issues. And I just wanted to call and see how her blood sugars were running since she got off of her insulin because I care and I wanted to know. So I, I used that impulsivity or that intuition and I gave her a call and she was thrilled to hear from me. You know, I, I feel like health coaching for me is interfering in someone's life. 
and like kind of almost like con marrying their life. Let's take everything out of the closets, <sighs> not hide anything. And let's ask ourselves, what is bringing me joy? You know, do I like red meat, but I hate fish? Okay, let's, let's not make ourselves eat fish because we don't like fish. That doesn't bring us joy, but steak does. So that, that goes to the joy pile. We're going to keep that. And so that's kind of the way I approach my clients. Yeah, you know, it's <clears throat> my individual program is very similar. I don't, I take each client one at a time and determine kind of where their starting place is and what, what I think they need and then um, tell them, and, and I'll express this, what you told me. This is how long I think it'll take us to get there. Um, we can adjust things on the fly, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we need 12 weeks or people that are super motivated because I get those too, right? The type A personality that really, they just need help drilling things down. Maybe they only need six weeks, right? Some people are like, I do not need to hear from you every week because I'm, I'm a big believer in, in talking every week or at least touching every week, right? Um, so you can, like on an individual basis, I'll do that individually. It's the, it's the group stuff and some of the online stuff that's much more automated. But it sounds to me like right now your wheelhouse and your passion and your joy is in the one-on-one -on -one client. I love it. I, I also really love my Facebook group though. I have like a little <laughs> group that always shows up for my Facebook lives, even if I throw them for a loop and do it at seven in the morning. You know? <laughs> it feels like I have my own little group of groupies on there, you know, that want to see me change the world and that love all my geeky little dumb memes that I put on there about living a positive and joyous life or, or making good choices or um, noticing the difference between perfection and success. You know, success is achievable and perfection is not. And and, uh, you know, some of these people are like, you know, they just post a little thing like, I so needed to hear that today. And it just fires up my engine. And I feel like I get more out of coaching than they'll ever get from me. You know, I really do. When you see someone's life transform, it's a beautiful thing. It's like getting to watch caterpillars turn into butterflies all the mm -hmm. time. And what's better than that? And then just the feedback from the medical community in my town when they see someone is, is changing their lifestyle and they, and they, you know, and the doctor says, my doctor told me to tell you, thank you, Anna, you know? <laughs> and I think that, you know, they have a lot of the medical community respects me because I do ask my clients to work closely with their doctor if they're diabetic and if they have, you know, medication issues that could, uh, you know, they could have a negative response if you just rip them off of a whole bunch of carbohydrates and, and don't have them working closely with their medical professional. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I just feel like I get so much more out of coaching than, uh, than my clients can yeah. ever get. No, they I hear you. Well that's, well, that's good. So I, um, well, earlier when you're telling your, um, kind of sharing your, your sort of um, inspiration for wanting to do this. You, you mentioned that as a recovering addict, you work with sponsors. And so that whole sponsor relationship made sense to you. And it kind of, I don't know much about, I don't know anything about that addiction space or how the sponsor relationship works, but my understanding is that it's gotta be, it's gotta be on demand because the, the, you need to, you need to be able to reach out to your sponsor in the moment when you need them. Like you can't book an appointment for a week from now with your sponsor. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of how you handle your coaching relationships? They're really more on demand. I want them to become independent, but I also want them to be interdependent, not codependent, if that makes sense. So I want them to be able to stand on their own two feet. And for me, that's how sponsorship works as well. My first sponsor told me that if I wanted to use in the middle of the night not to call her because she was a barber and she had four kids and she needed her sleep, she told me I should pray. And I said, to what? I don't believe in God. And she said, well, that's okay. God believes in you. And something about that really just shocked oh, me. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, okay. And there was this guy at meetings when I was first going to meetings that would always say, I have a God and she's black. And I have this... <laughs> I'm an antique bank because I, I was dealing antiques at the time. And so one night I felt like using and I said a little prayer to Aunt Jemima. Well, there was a shift in my spirit. In other words, I asked for help, you know, right. or I admitted that, that I needed something. And I think um, 
I'm not going to ask people to pray to Aunt Jemima or whatever, you know, but, but I am going to ask them to do the things they can do, much like the serenity prayer, you know, uh, do the things I can do and leave the rest to a higher power, whatever that is. That could be your faith in humanity. It could be your faith in your coach that my coach is telling me to do this. I'm going to just do the next right thing and wait and see what the outcome is. And so I think, you know, I don't really coddle people or bubble wrap people. I cheerlead them. I, I point out where they've already been successful in life. Look, you've raised three kids. One's a doctor, one's a lawyer, one's a stay-at-home mom. You've done great. You, you know how to succeed. You can do this too. Oh, yeah. I love that. Brad, um, I talk about him all the time. <laughs> Poor guy. But, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before. He's, and you know this, he's a recovering alcoholic as well. And AA has done wonders for him as well. His, when you have the right sponsor, um, it's just, and, you know, he was never really a religious person, but he believes that there is, he does believe in God, particularly now at this point, but we're not really churchgoers. But at the end of the day, for him, it all boils down to it's not about him necessarily, that there's so much more important. There's something more important than him out yeah. there. And for him, I think he ties us back to our girls, you know, um, and that every decision he makes is from with that, that kind of point of view. And he has learned, it took, this was hard for him. And I think this correlates to coaching and clients. The really hard thing to learn was to try to not stress and sweat over the stuff you can't control. That's, it's so hard, but that was probably one of the biggest game changers for him. And I find that with many of my health coaching clients when it's, well, I've got this that cr Christmas party that I have to go to and this, that, and the other thing, there's going to be cookies there. And I'm like, okay, so first of all, do you have to go? Yes, I have to go. And here's why. Okay. Um, second of all, you might not be able to control what they're serving, but what can you control? Right. Right. And let's troubleshoot that and talk about that now. And it just changes the entire mindset. I love that. It really does. People are um, micromanagers, I think. And, the, and that's a lot out of fear. You know, uh, I, I think fear is based on, well, in coaching, I guess we call it, uh, that we're not going to get what we need, what, uh, scarcity thinking, mm -hmm. you know, and they basically, they think, I never got what I wanted. I'm not getting what I want now. I might not get what I want tomorrow. And they really don't even know what they want is the problem. They really don't appreciate what they have is the problem. And so mm -hmm. if you can get into a mindset of appreciating what you've got, like every day I wake up and I'm grateful for toilet paper because <laughs> you know, in my addiction, I was actually homeless on the streets of Los Angeles as an 18 year old pregnant girl. Mm -hmm. So toilet paper is a very lovely thing to have, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, just these small things and I have a sense of humor about it, but toilet paper is, is something that like, if I have a sponsee who's moving out of a shelter and they're getting their place, I go to Sam's Club and I buy them a big package of toilet paper to say, you know, here's your welcome to your home gift. And they're always thrilled to have it, you know? And if we can make small things great things and these, these monsters in the closet that don't even exist can go away, then, then we can enjoy the day and we can live in the moment. And I always tell my clients, if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy with a certain number on the scale. And that's just the truth. And I'm coaching you to learn how to live a full life so you don't have to stuff yourself with all of these bad things. So you don't have to abuse yourself and punish yourself with exercise. So you don't have to do these things to yourself. So you can live with dignity and self-respect. Wow. I, I, I really touched on the, the micromanagement thing, something that I fight, I, I fight against in my practice. I would say that's probably one of my biggest crusades is like, we don't have to micromanage everything. So I love that you brought that up. But in my practice, what I've learned is that a lot of, a lot of our, my clients' tendencies to micromanage everything it, it was foisted upon them by the health and fitness industry. So kind of like we were talking about earlier, it's not even really your fault that you, you're, you're in this micromanagement spiral. And what I've found is that it's, it's 
like I've broken it down to the point where it's like we've been getting value from extrinsic factors for so long we've forgotten what it's like to have intrinsic motivation they we just lost connection with intrinsic motivation so it sounds like you pull that out for people I try to I try to see who they really want to be and I try to help them define that and own that so that they can live from that I think power mm -hmm. you know? well I don't want to you know be on this board so don't be on that board say no to being on the library board or whatever it is that's your time if if you would rather just the library is important to you and you can write a check to them go ahead and do that if you would rather just go in and out and volunteer do that but don't do something against your will you know and i think that that's we get taken hostage by these big plans and these ideas and oh if i just stay on this diet center plan and i eat three bars a day and drink one shake and have a, a, you know a, a skinless chicken breast and some salad with no oil on it then i will be happy and i will weigh the number that i'm supposed to weigh and you keep buying these hyper palatable things mm -hmm. that are completely processed and not nutrient dense and why don't why don't we i i love laura that you say um be a nutrivore you know yeah. that whole thing like that we can we can do that in every aspect of our life you know yeah. is are we feeding each other in relationship as partners like me and my husband you know how are we feeding that relationship what you feed grows and that's just a fact so anything you give your attention to that's taking away from your real core values that's not helping you yeah yeah i was thinking i just had a, a coaching call with my group that i'm doing right now and today's topic was i need to be prepared which is a soundbite i get from clients yeah. all the time well i just need to be more prepared if, if a client has a bad day or a bad week, they'll just, oh, I just need to be more prepared. It's like, tap the brakes on that language because that's not action language. Somebody told you to say that. Right. So let's actually talk about where, where, you're, where you feel you're falling short. Is preparation really the thing or is, is preparation the thing that's missing or is it intuition or is it something else completely? And, and so a lot of people will dismiss the opportunity to grow from within because they think they just need to be prepared or I just need to eat chicken breast with salad or I just, I just need to, I just need to, I just need to. And that language is so pervasive from our clients. Yeah. So I think as coaches, one of our jobs is to like say, whoa, let's, let's go deeper into this and find out what you will do, what you can do and what you do, what you do do. Like telling a client to just failing to plan is planning to fail. If that person's not good at planning, right. Then they're failing. It's like, that can't be that black and white for people. Yeah. yeah. You know, a great question. Like, so planning for what exactly? Because I, prior to having changed my dietary strategy and I was eating more of a processed food, lower fat, whole grain diet, I felt like I had to be prepared for that moment that I knew was coming, that hangry moment that I could feel my blood sugar falling. I had to have snacks that were, and, and, they were in every nook and cranny. They were in my purse. They were in my car. Like I, I would find, I still find stuff in like old purses. I'm like, oh, just a pack of nuts <laughs> or a thing, of, you know, but like I always had to have that snack that I was prepared for. And now that I'm just kind of more comfortable in my own skin, I eat a different way. I don't get it. Sure. Do I get hungry? Yeah, but I don't get hangry. I don't feel panicked. So if there's just not something around for me to eat right now, Oh, well, I guess I'll wait <laughs> till I'm someplace where I can get this. But that's, that's a big, big mindset shift. Well, you I know? think what you're talking about is a food emergency. Yeah. You have those when your body isn't fat adapted. And mm -hmm. when it is, there's no such thing as a food emergency. There just isn't. But then there's also that addictive side of us going back to addiction where I know I'm a sugar addict. There's no such thing as one gummy worm for this mm -hmm. And one is too many and a thousand is never enough. And I'm actually enrolled to take Fit and Johnson's um, sugar addiction course. And I'm mm -hmm. really excited about it. She's, uh, she does uh, sugar addiction stuff for diet doctor. She lives in Sweden and she's amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm just so excited about it because I think that some people have other issues. Like you have your normal 
normal people that are going to be able to exhibit some self-control and some of us get our brains hijacked. Right. And uh, there someone had posted that syringe full of sugar. You know, I, I think you guys probably remember seeing it. And I think it was Phil Malfatone that sugar is truly an addictive drug and that they've studied it and shown that addicts are addicted to sugar prior to being addicted to some kind of substance. And this really fascinates me and definitely is in my wheelhouse as a person. And so, you know, I think uh, if I do have a niche in the future, it's going to be sugar addiction and it will probably be, you know, four day workshops helping people to see, you know, that this is a huge problem and some of us need to abstain, period. Right. Some of us can do the paleo thing and we can do the natural sweetness and this and that. For me, you know, one little taste of honey and I want to just sit there and eat the jar like Winnie the Pooh, you know, <laughs> that's just honest. That's just who I am. And I'm not ashamed of that. It's just the way I'm wired. And so, and I think that that's something too, the shame and the guilt that people have around food. It's, yeah. it's crazy. It is nuts. And then the, the diet industry, which is billions of dollars in income for these people that are making you feel worse about yourself because you can't stick to their incredibly strict, restrictive, exacting plan. Like you have to calories in, calories out. You have to do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around just to get a result that is fleeting because you're trying to fool the machinery that you are, the body that you are, the hormones that you have. You cannot lie to your body. It will know. Yes. Yes. It's so interesting. It's so funny to me that um, there's some people who argue that, that sugar is not addictive. And it's so wild to me that that's even up for debate, but you know, they'll pull out, they'll pull out the research. Well, this research shows that, you know, and it's like the experience people are having, <laughs> why aren't we not tapping to the experience people are having? And if somebody self identifies as a sugar addict, don't come at me with your research that says they're not, they believe they are. And as long as they believe that, and they're in that shame spiral, right. they're going to be as if they are addicted to sugar, regardless of what that research says. So I love that you're going to go down that, down that train. So Bitten Johnson, I've never heard of this person. So is this a, uh, a sugar addict coaching course kind of thing? Uh, you can actually, um, you can actually diagnose someone with sugar addiction. I'm not medical, so I won't be able to do the diagnosis, but I'll have the tools and I can use it in my practice to help me. Mm -hmm. Um, she lives in Sweden and she has helped with sugar or helped people with sugar addiction for over 20 years. And she's also a recovering addict with over 30 years clean, I think 34 years clean. And she's very blunt about it. You know, I mean, uh, people hide candy wrappers. People take things out of the trash and eat them when no one is looking. Mm -hmm families say to them you don't want to eat that you you know you said you wanted to stop eating that people beg their spouses to go get them another half gallon of ice cream they bargain and they spend money behind people's backs every behavior that an addict has with uh, with a substance abuse every single bell rings for sugar addiction yeah if you're a sugar addict, you will have shame and guilt and you will hide and lie and cheat and do things to, to get your sugar fix. Robert Lustig has been, I mean, screaming about how that sugar is an addictive substance. And quite frankly, look, I think you're absolutely right. There are some people that are going to be more, some people can start smoking in college and give it up and it's no problem versus others are literally addicted for life to nicotine, right? So nicotine is a known addictive substance, but there are some people that just never get addicted to it. Same thing with alcohol and other substances. So to just turn around and just say, sugar's not addictive is, there's so much evidence to the contrary. And it's also a very individual, very individual thing. Mm -hmm. If the behaviors fit, that's yeah. all I'm saying. Let's forget about science. Let's forget about anything else. If you have addictive behavior that is causing you shame and guilt and is causing you to do something against your will, you say you don't want to eat that sugar and you're eating it anyway. I don't know how long I wanted to quit using drugs 
Mm -hmm. couldn't do it. Well, just one more time, then I'll stop. And that's the same game people play with a lot of their food addictions. And these companies hire scientists and wire up their brains to see yeah. that dopamine response is happening so they can sell more. I've seen kids cry in the grocery store for Takis. Please, mm -hmm. mom, give me Takis, give me Takis. You know, please, mom. And they're on their knees like a junkie, you know, <laughs> seriously. Like, I'm, wow, you're just like yeah. a little junkie. What's next? What are you gonna need to ding, 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 ding? To not, you know, you're never gonna find peace. That's part of why my business is called Peace of Keto. Like, I want people to just kind of, you know, relax and chill, and let's just let's just do what's in front of us. Let's just do today and not worry about, you know, a year from now. But what I find is most people what they want is a quality of life, not a number on a scale. They want to take care of themselves for as long as they can and drop dead, just like Mark Sisson talks about. They don't care, give me another wrinkle as long as I'm standing upright and I can walk and I can do these things. And you know, some of the little stupid things I tell my clients to do is get down on the floor to put your shoes on mm -hmm. <laughs> and then get back up every single day, get down and get up. And I have, you know, I have some clients in their early seventies that now they're doing that like four and five times a day. And they've gotten to the point where they're watching some of these natural movement videos mm -hmm. and they're like getting up faster than me and <laughs> more elegantly than I can because they, they've really taken it to heart that that kind of movement's going to keep them fit for, for activities that they want to be able to perform, not to be a bikini model, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, what would you say to clients who come to you and they, they, they've articulated and they've expressed they want this quality of life and this live long, drop dead? Do you ever get this pushback where, they, where they'll say, and, and part of enjoying my life is having cake every day or something like that? Like, have you ever heard of people justify the treat foods that aren't serving them as part of their quality of life? And if so, how do you move them sort of into an awakening around that? Well, I've got a few punks like that that want to, you know, they want to poke the bear and they come in and they challenge me every time. And I'm like, you have to decide what you really want. That's your decision. Mm -hmm. All's in your court. I can't make you do anything. You're right. If you want to eat cake every day, you can. Is that going to serve your goals? Is that going to serve what you say you want? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be truly living out your values? Yeah, great. Yeah, sometimes it's a conversation of, but what do you want more, <laughs> right? You're telling me you want this. You want to what, insert whatever goal is and how important that is. But you also want cake. And these two things don't, they don't work together. So you've got to decide what you want more and can continue to kind of bring that back. And sometimes in the moment, they want the cake more. And then I often will find once, once they kind of, kind of go down that road, particularly if they've been abstaining from it for a long time, they realize it's not as good as I remembered. Right. Or something hurts after they eat it and they yeah. get feedback. Yeah. yeah. So think too, you know, going back to that whole addiction thing, what, what, how is the cake is so temporary? How is this really edifying your life? How is this empowering you? Why is cake so important? You know, there's a saying about our whole life and thinking was centered in using, getting using and finding ways it means to get more. Why, if cake is gone out of every day, your life is gonna fall to crap. What is this really all about? <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's just kind of true. Like we get so dependent on one little idea of something that we're like pit bulls and we can't give that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's room for folks, again, who aren't addicts, that once they get their taste buds under control, their hormones under control, their gut health under control, they can probably have it once in a while and be able to put the fork down and like take a bite and then move on, right? So it's yeah. kind of like this, why, why it, Right now, it feels like all or nothing because we're still healing, right? There's, there's reasons why. So is there maybe room down the road? Maybe, but again, you don't, you know, you don't know until... Or what about just living for today? Right. What about tomorrow? 
And don't beat yourself up over yesterday if you had a quote unquote relapse on your food of choice or whatever. You know, maybe you maybe pizza's your your sugar of choice. Oh yeah. It have to be something that our tongue perceives as sweet, but our body knows that it's sweet because it doesn't know the difference between one carb and another. Mm-hmm. The point being we could we could have that relapse and we could learn from it. And today we could say just this one day, I'm just not going to eat that way. I'm right. in one meal at a time. I'm going to choose the most nutrient dense foods that I can put into my body that at the same time are absolutely delicious. I teach my clients how to make pizza casserole. You know, I teach them actual things that are going to taste good, that yes, there, there's some hyper palatability to um, pepperoni. Don't tell me that there's not because there's <laughs> meats are hyper palatable and you might eat a little bit more, but you're not going to derail your entire life over making a pizza casserole once a month. And you're going to feel some joy eating that pizza casserole or whatever it is. That's yeah. your food that you, you mm-hmm. love. I'm Italian. You know, I grew yeah. up mm-hmm. eating pasta and sourdough bread and Recently, I found a great um, bread recipe, and I never use whey proteins and things like that, but this bread recipe had it in there, and it was delicious, and my 15-year-old daughter was just over the moon happy that I made it, and it was worth the joy that it brought her, and I'm going to make it and turn it into dressing for um, Thanksgiving, and I'm thrilled to have that little trick up my sleeve for a special occasion. It's a great time we live in. Well. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I was uh, cruising the social sphere, uh, like you do, scrolling through my feed, and I make it a point of following people who are not in alignment with my nutritional beliefs because I think it's just good to have a really broad view of what's going on out there. And one of these people who I won't I won't bother naming and shaming, what is um, the macro macro guy, mm-hmm. like uh, if it fits your macros type of thing, and he was trying to be polarizing. He said, anybody who tells you you can't screw up your diet in one day is wrong. Here's an example of how you can screw up your whole diet in one day. So if you, you're, you're on plan all week and then on Friday, you just like have a whole cheesecake and a pizza. Well, you here's how, here's how you've obliterated your whole progress for the week. And it's like, okay, perhaps statistically, yes, but spiritually and like philosophically, that doesn't help people like, Oh, you're really, re- you're really screwed up. So I love that you come back the next day and say, this is a whole new day and let's just make a different choice today. So I think that that's, um, I-, I would love that message to kind of permeate a little bit more amongst nutrition and specifically nutrition coaches that it doesn't help our clients to tell them that they're screwing up if they, if they screw up, like mm-hmm. it's a thing that happened, you can move on from it and let's work on strategies for when the next time this happens. So you don't have to feel into the shame spiral like you do right now. Or were they eating their emotions or some other thing that you ought to be caring about that you have alongside them and saying, you know, what's going on? Was there something, you know, did you feel lack? Did you feel lack of support from your family? Is there something you need to say? Is something eating your lunch? Because it's not what we're eating. It's what's eating us, right? And yeah. sometimes I think when people want this cake every day, they're not eating the cake. The cake is eating them. And mm-hmm. sometimes we have to get to that underlying, what, why aren't you good enough that you, you have to sabotage yourself? What's going on there? Because I think you're great. I see this strength, that strength, the other strength. You show up to your appointments on time. You get your homework done. You're completely honest with me or you wouldn't be telling me about this. And I really appreciate that. So how can this great person sitting in front of me, what, what is making you derail yourself? So I think that curiosity thing that Christina talks about, you know, asking those questions, maybe they won't get the answer overnight or right there at that visit, but by the time they come back to you, I think they usually have it. Mm -hmm. Most people, I think when you ask them to reflect and you just ask them the right questions, they're able to answer themselves you know, rather they're looking to you for an answer, but really they've got to be able to answer it themselves. They know they just needed the coaching and the support, right. To, to let their mind go there, I think, you know, and to feel safe going there. 
Well, and I think too, it can be a number of problems on the scale of <clears throat> not wanting to take personal responsibility or they flat out just wanted to eat that thing. You know, they just wanted to eat it. And in which case that's okay. You just made a decision and you feel guilty about your decision, but you, you only answer to yourself. I don't feel that my coaching clients answer to me. Right. I'm not the authority of morality in their life. Mm -hmm. They can go to bed with their head on their pillow, guilt-free, and they decided to eat a piece of cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory, and they enjoyed it, then great. I am happy that they were able to do that, and then the next day, you know, do that whole 80-20 thing. I think that that's wonderful. And in fact, I think that's real growth when people say, I'm taking responsibility for my actions instead of making excuses. Yeah, that's enormous. That's an enormous breakthrough for people. Uh, like I call that the self-honoring choice. Like you went out and you had the cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory. Was it awesome? How awesome was it? Was every bite awesome? How did you feel right after? How did you feel while you were ordering it? How did like have the full experience of it? Like sometimes... Sometimes, sometimes, you know, um, a nice strip loin and a nice salad is a self-honoring choice. Sometimes a big slab of cheesecake is a self-honoring choice. And there's not, not, neither one of those is right or wrong, but you have to come to a place of self-awareness before you can um, adequately mm -hmm. like drop mm -hmm. into those choices. And so I, I just think, I love your approach, Anna, because it's, it's not preachy and teachy. It's very whole. It's very supportive. It's very respectful of people because people have been, um, treating themselves with such disrespect for, at this point, generations around dieting and body image. And we, we just were generations deep in, in disrespect and self-loathing. And, and, and I think that our, one of our big jobs as coaches is to hold people up and mm -hmm. remind them that they're capable and they're awesome. And that the food they eat and the body they walk around with is just a tiny piece of who they are. Mm -hmm. And that it's, it's easier to take, take control and have fun with it than they've been led to believe. Exactly. And, you know, C.S. Lewis, he has a quote, it goes something like, you're not a body, you're a soul, you have a body. And that's what I truly believe that if, if we were all blind for one day, we would probably end up having friends we never expected to have in our lives. And then when we were, when our eyes were opened, that friend might be completely different culture, completely different lifestyle, different religion, different political belief. It wouldn't matter because we would be seeing each other clearly rather than seeing the packaging. And I think people get so wrapped up in packaging. And I coach you not to the packaging, but to the person that lives in that packaging. To me, my body is a house. Mm -hmm. And it houses me. And what kind of shape am I really in? You know, and what kind of shape do I really want to be in? I had a coaching appointment with a couple of clients that were kind of winding down and wrapping up. Now we're talking about their retirement. We're not even talking about food. We're talking about who do you want to be and how do you want to live in your retirement years? And one of the homework assignments I gave them is to write down a list of places they would like to go together. They're kind of nerds like I am, like they would like to go on the road scholar trips to Egypt and things like that. I bring that one up because my, my uh, in-laws are doing that coming up oh. next week and they're going on this road scholar tour where they're going to sit with, you know, professors of Egyptology and then they're going to see all of these sites. And to me, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And so we started talking about these things and I see them building up an excitement instead of a fear based on now, you know, now they're, they know how to get their body to cooperate with them, to be as healthy as possible. You know, what else can we do to enhance this life? How are we going to, how, how does our soul want to be? Where, what does our soul want to be doing? And they got really just visibly excited. Nice. I love that. Yeah. And you've got a, a you know, just the notion that, um, you know, we are a soul that has a body and you've got to take care of that body in order for that soul to experience things. Right. And all, you know, your limitations are all for the most part in your own head right? Um, if you're committed to something, you can go. And, and um, Aaron, I love what you said. It's our job as coaches to, to lift our clients up and hold them up, right? Because we will hear, I hear my clients saying, I need somebody to hold me accountable. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm a stranger. I'm not yes, in your life. Right? So I'm, I'm, you are accountable to yourself. 
right? And it's my job to help support you in that. At the end of the day, it's your decision, right? Because I, I will also hear clients say, I did a coach Laura or coach Laura would be so proud of me, you know, and I'm like, that's awesome. But you know what? I'm always proud of you. Are you proud of you? Did you make yourself proud and why? Um, it's just, just, it's a different kind of mindset, but to a certain degree, I guess in the beginning, when you enter into a coaching relationship, they kind of use us as a crutch a little mm -hmm. bit. Right. Um, and then hopefully by the end of that relationship, that rather than that crutch, it just becomes like a walking stick. <laughs> you know, that's there along your walk and your journey with you, right? Um, the so. end form that we are provided with is fabulous and it unearths so many gems to, to work with your client. You know, I, I have not found the need to change one question on there. And it always, I, I, I think maybe, you know, I didn't know I was doing it wrong is how come I'm doing the free session with the, the 20 minutes isn't long enough for me. I like to talk, you know, mm -hmm. so, so I just kind of just decided I'm just going to do a free session. Sometimes I book myself an hour and a half. If it lasts that long, that's fine. Sometimes it lasts only a half an hour, 45 minutes, but the, the things that people divulge about themselves on that intake form when they're really desperate for help, they're desperate. I feel so honored and privileged to be able to see inside of another human being that way. You know, so whether they're going to work with me or not, I just want them to feel like, thank you so much for sharing all of this information with me and taking time out of your day to come and sit and talk with me, you know, and, and I do uh, mostly, I, I have my big program that I do with the cooking school and all that, but, you know, I've had people come to me that literally don't have money. They're literally um, destitute from autoimmune disease, whatever they're on welfare or, or you know, they're, they're on Medicare. Uh, they're getting, benefits because they can't work because of their problem. And I've had people where I'll, I'll say, okay, well, I'll coach you and it's only going to cost this much. Like maybe I do a $300 or whatever. And I might meet with them for like maybe four half hour sessions, but I give them a lot of homework to do. I give them a lot of YouTube videos to watch. I get them on my piece of keto, you know, um, and they do the work. They mm -hmm. do the work. And I don't feel like I'm um, cheaping out on myself by doing that because uh, I want to help people. And so, so I really do custom tailor if I have to. I wish that I could just coach everybody for, to the result, you know, but not everybody can afford to be coached to the result. And so, you know, my heart is in this mm -hmm. and, uh, and kind of like Mark Sisson says, he wants to reach however many people you know, I kind of think of myself like Grand Island. I want to at least re reach everyone here some way or somehow with some hope that they can, they can grow and change their life, even if they just remove industrial seed oils and reduce sugar and grains. Mm -hmm. so I would, would be happy. You've mm -hmm. got little kids like Dr. Lustig talks about with yeah. Fatty liver disease, which wasn't even a, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, was not a diagnosis until the 1990s. And we have little kids with their bellies hanging over their knees in my town. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to do it. Me too. I think yeah. Well, I hope so. I'm working on it. I'm actually going to start a walking group at the mall once a week. I got permission from the mall office. There you go to do a walk and talk with the coach. And so it'll be just you know, maybe 45 minutes every Wednesday morning. I'm probably gonna get started next week and I'll just keep going until people show up. That's a great I idea. Dreams, you know? yeah. <laughs> Build the baseball field and people will show up. You yeah. know? Well, especially in these areas where it's just so hard to get outside in the winter. What yeah. a great idea to be able to take a walk through the mall. And some of my clients are walking at the mall anyway. So if they can join me and get some extra time with me, that's fabulous. And I get some extra time with them. And my clients are fabulous people. I'm sure you guys feel the same way about your clients. But I actually, I absolutely love them. 
you know, I have this one client who he's down 108 pounds. He's eight, eight, he's 80 years old. He's going on his second knee replacement. He's off of his diabetes medications. He's, I mean, he had weeping edema of the legs when he came to me. Wow. You know, and now he's vibrant and healthy. And, you know, he sent, he sent me a client from Denver. We're going to be meeting on the phone this coming week. And so you know, and I do, you know, FaceTime or whatever. So that's, of course, a different pricing as well. But I'm not shy to price. I doubled my prices within my first, like, three months of coaching because I realized I'm going to get a resentment if I'm not getting paid enough money for all the work that I do. Yeah. And now I'm not resentful. I feel like I'm giving people even more value than what I'm charging. So I say don't be afraid to charge. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. That's a, I, love, I love how you put that. It's, you know, you want to love what you're doing. And part of that is being able to help more. Like ultimately that's what we want to do. I think that that gets lost sometimes. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of in this, this period right now where I'm hiring, hiring a business coach to elevate my business. And a lot of the business coaches are like, make five figures a month, make six figures, seven figures a year. It's like money, 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 money. And people have forgotten that we're actually doing this to change people's lives. And so uh, like I, but, but, but the abundance of, of money enables you to be abundant in, in giving back to your clients. And it's, it's all this, it's the full abundance picture. Mm -hmm. um, but I love how you, how you actually phrase that. I think that was a really awesome little sound bite for people to jot down and double their prices and feel good about doing that because you can give more and do more right. and be more impactful. Well, this one gal that just got off of her insulin, she's disabled because she has a horrible autoimmune disease as well. And so her income is very limited. And I said, just pay what you can when you can. I really want to help her. She really wants help. Who cares if that takes 12 months or 18 months? What do I care? You know, uh, a lot of my clients pay in three payments. Some of them pay in one payment. And I have the majority of my clients paying over 12 months. Big deal. What do I care? It's regular money coming in for me. Uh, they're getting what they want <laughs> and I'm able to help them. So I don't freeze myself out of helping people by having uh, only this payment plan or that payment plan. I really do try to work with what they um, can do. And I, I actually am getting coached right now too, not really um, for business, but just, uh, complete kind of life coaching. And I really like what I'm, what I'm doing with this gal because she really does keep me focused on who do I want to be? Yeah. What qualities do I want to have as a person? And, you know, I want to be um, respected because of my integrity. That's hugely important to me. So, it, you know, having integrity and having respect because I keep my word you know, I, I under promise and over deliver that kind of thing is important to me. I was a hairdresser as my first job mm. and boy, you want, you want that woman to feel like a million bucks. I did the scalp massage. I was back in the day, you know, where we were really, and then, you know, I was a nurse and I wanted to leave every single one of my patients with their dignity intact. Mm. And there's a lot of people that don't do that. You know, they, they want to just get it done with their job hurry up, you know, are you down on the commode yet? I mean, I've heard it all. And then I, I uh, managed cosmetic lines and I, I was a makeup artist for years and people aren't coming to the mall to buy stuff. They're coming to the mall because they're bored. So I understood right. they wanted to be entertained and treated. And so whether they were going to buy makeup or not, I'd sit them down in my chair and say, you want to play with makeup? And I did this one day for this lady who was wearing like Kmart clothes. Well, it turns out she owned a cement plant and she literally bought every single thing I touched her face with. And I didn't chimp, I didn't chump out. Mm -hmm. I gave her the full treatment. So she, in cash, she paid me like 900 and some dollars in cosmetics, body products, and skincare that day. And all wow. the other uh, makeup counters around me were, I can't believe that. I watched her walk by those counters. My point being is, we don't know what someone's ability to pay is. We don't know what someone's ability, each person should be treated. Like they walk in, I, they could look one way and, I, and, and if I have prejudgment about whether they're gonna wanna pay me or not, I'm shortchanging myself and them. Yeah. I have no idea, I need to treat them 
the exact way I would treat any other person. And that's a principle of recovery too, principles before personalities, you know? And so I need to have that integrity with each person that I'm doing this free session with so that they can feel the exact same thing anyone else would feel. And then it's, it's the balls in their court, it's their decision. And even somebody with not a lot of resources will find the resources if they see the value. They will. Yeah, yeah. so we got to bring the value. That's our job. Wow, this was great. I've had a great yeah. conversation. I've enjoyed myself. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but I thought this was great. I enjoyed myself too. It's good to see you guys. And, you know, I mean, you guys were just so helpful to me coming to the master class. Uh, just... I don't want to say lit a fire under my butt that made me feel like just go and do something, just do a little bit every day and just watch things happen. I don't know what, I, I don't have an end product in my mind. I have a way of being in mind. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you were talking about, Erin, like who's, who am I? You know, that's really our brand, isn't it? It's right. not a, uh, I mean, Mark Sisson, he's all the detail-oriented guy and science-y and this and that. That's not me. Me, I'm like, how are you doing? And I really want to know. <laughs> you know, I don't want the shorthand version. So I just, I just think, you know, you guys gave me the confidence to just be myself and go out there and do what I need to do. Yeah. Well, you're doing really well. We're, you're a real success story. And I think you're going to inspire a lot of people who are listening. So thank you very much, Anna. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some uh, directions as to where people can find you if they want to learn more about what you're doing? Well, a uh, piece of keto. If you type that in on Facebook, you can even join my Facebook group. And all you have to do is ask to join. P-E-A-C-E. -E, piece yes. of keto. Yes, as a piece, like the hippie piece. Yeah. yeah and peace that surpasses understanding as well because I am a Christian but I don't bring religion into my business um but the principles of unconditional love and fellowship and all that definitely are in there um and then I I have peace of keto online which is just my my Facebook page and they can reach out to me there and I am working on Kajabi I'm trying to get a, a free course up and running and I actually don't even want it to be a funnel and I haven't figured out how to do that yet. I just want to give it away, just a small little thing. And one thing that I want people to know is if, if I'm not their cup of tea, somebody out there is. So find someone with a true message of primal health and align yourself with somebody you can follow and you can trust. Because just because I'm trustworthy doesn't mean I'm going to be everybody's cup of tea. And I understand that. So I'm actually looking at this as I want to give something away of value. If it's valuable to you, great. And if you're like, oh my God, her voice drives me crazy, find somebody else because there are other people out there, you know? So, so that's kind of my invitation or my, in, the introduction I want people to have of me. They don't have to get an email every week or this or that. They'll sign up if they want to. And I truly trust that. I don't know if it's been done before, but that's just feels authentic to me, like who I want to be. Like come in if you want to, but don't come in if you don't want to. Like I don't want to take hostages. Mm -mm. No. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anna. This was really awesome. I loved every, every minute of it. All right. We'll see you guys. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.